I am just so proud to, to be in your company, but also to be a partner for change with both of you. If you could just tell me who you are, what you do, and let's go with, I'm gonna, this is the only thing I'm gonna read from the card is the title, Drivers of Change. These are two tremendous change agents with the power to do something and do great things, mega trends that are reshaping our world. Um, after this, now that I read that, I'm going off script. Who are you, what do you do? And then if you were to create a headline in the New York Times on equality, what would it say? That is a great opening question. First, thank you for the invite. So last year I had the privilege of doing a panel, actually with, with your Meredith, yeah. and it was the highlight of my week here in Davos. So we better not screw this up because I've got this absolutely <laughs> no pristine image in my mind that I, I really don't want to dissipate. Uh, Joe Yukazoglu, I have the privilege of leading Deloitte in the US. I love the headline question. You know, earlier today, somebody asked me, you know, how would you compare the diversity here in Davos this year to last year? Um, last year, I might have said, you know, kind of terrible. Um, this year, I'd say a little better, so it's slightly better than terrible. If you had to ask me to pick a headline, we are making progress, but not nearly fast enough. So the headline would probably be progress, but not nearly fast enough. I like that. So, so firstly, can I say that, that Joe and I were worried that the audience here wouldn't know we were suits, so we both wore ties, just so. Uh, <laughs> I just said that though. Uh, you okay. Consistently, navy suit, light shirt, and either blue, yellow, or red tie. I know, it's, I like, that. it's like some weird mind meld or whatever. Anyway, there we go. Uh, um, it, my headline's the same. I'm, I'm Mark Thompson. I'm the uh, chief executive of the New York Times. Company. Just saying. And not quickly enough is my headline, not quickly enough. I, I went to a, you know, I don't really particularly want to cast stones, but whatever. Um, I went to one of the um, kind of subgroups that the um, uh, that WEF organizes. This is kind of media and entertainment. And actually, in a way, quite an interesting meeting. And we had um, uh, one of the elements I did an interview with Rohit Chopra as one of the FTC commissioners, you know, big tech. Um, and, and media and entertainment, well, how does that all play out, regulation, antitrust, all that stuff. And, you know, there's probably about 28, 30 people in the room, you know. There are two women, maybe, two women. It's 2020. And I have to say, and I, I don't, I mean, it's the industry. I mean, to be fair, this is like a CEO's meeting. And, you know, you, you can't really blame the forum for the, you know, in some ways for the reality of the, the surely to God we could have a, a, a few chief operating officers, you know, chief digital officers and the rest of it. But I have to say, I mean, one thought I came away with is we, you know, some of us, we should kind of get together and work out really whether any of us should be going to meetings like that anymore. I mean, I swear to God, I'd been very happy to give up my seat. And I, I just think we've got to begin to think about, you know, if we're told that maybe in 2030 or 2040, we'll be at 50-50. But I just think it's kind of, it's, we, you know, we, it's so slow. And there's so many conversations you have where the other person starts with, you have to understand. You know, oh. you have to understand. There was, a great, there was a great line this week <laughs> that somebody said, oh, well, you know, maybe X, Y, Z is not ready. And that not ready has become code for, let's just hire people with the attributes that are the same as what we always have. And when yeah. you look at, you know, you and I and the, the businesses yeah. that we lead, these are people-based organizations. We win and differentiate ourselves in the market by having the best people. And how can you possibly do that if you're missing out on yeah. a, a big segment of society. This is a business imperative to differentiate ourselves. And this funny thing, which I, I know, I mean, these absolutely gigantic giants like Deloitte's, everyone here will know. I mean, what, what, what percentage of millennial, what, what percentage of the workforce is millennial? Almost 80. 80%. And they've been some of the fastest and earliest adopters of really quite profound engagement with the diversity. Because their workforce, I mean, I, by the way, I don't think millennials, I, I don't want to make these two generations. It's like generational, millennials say what many other people have felt for years, and these guys have got the, the kind of front to just come out and say it, whoever, whoever the, is on the receiving end. Now, and the weird thing about our, our journey at the Times, which has really been about trying to, to really grasp the nettle of digital and try and, in a sense, you know, turn a classic, someone's deeply conservative, 
newspaper organization into a true digital engine, and we're making some progress. But one of the byproducts is we're, we're 50% millennial now, and we have plenty of Gen Zs as well. And the expectations of that workforce, what they all expect, whatever gender, whatever color, whatever sexual orientation, what the, their expectations are ones we have to meet. And we cannot say to them, without them bursting out laughing, we've got a plan which maybe by 2035 might deliver this. You know, next week or next month, even next year might cut it, but we can't come up with the old excuses anymore. It just won't work. They, I mean, you know, they're not used to the old excuses and they don't like the sounds of them. So there's something about listening to our colleagues and just understanding where we are in the world and the zeitgeist now, which I think should give you know, people doing jobs like us, a real sense of urgency. But here's the challenge. First of all, where are all the women? Hello. We're all here. There's more than two of us in this room. Come on, give it up. And you got people up there applauding for you guys, talking about the 80% millennial, and then you talk about Congress. It's boring. Let's just be honest. It's boring. It's the same people over and over. And if you truly want to evolve, you need to have the right people in the room. And, you know, and you're talking millennials. We need to listen to all these different perspectives. And when you're, both of your headlines was progress but not fast <coughs> enough, in this place, we've been talking about solutions for change, yeah. not about the problems, yeah. but what are the solutions for change and how do we create the measurement for accountability so that we actually close the gaps instead of just narrow them? Because if we try narrowing them, yeah. they're going to continue to be gaps, right? Can I talk about one thing that we've, 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 we've done quite recently, and significantly this work's been led by my very dear friend and colleague, Meredith copert Levian. Woo woo! Uh, and, and what Meredith has done, and by the way, Meredith and I, I think, have presided over four, at least four, failed attempts at reorganizing in digital. Um, a bit like a battering ram. I thought we got closer each time, and eventually, you know, we got there. Number five, which is a mission-driven organization with t massive delegation down to multidisciplinary teams right at the front. Often these teams are led by people in their late 20s, middle to late 20s, or very early 30s. At that point, you can see decision-making taking, pla taking place in a way which is, in some ways, outside the traditional structures of the organization and where we've actually vested all the real power, decision-making power with the missions rather than the, the, if you like, the professional silos. One byproduct of that, and the enormous number of new people who've come into the organization, specifically in the digital skills, data science, product, engineering, design, the rest of it, is it's an incredibly diverse group as well. And so these kids, the kind of machine learning team who come and talk to you, is they look the way the whole company should look. So at the very least, at the cutting edge of what we're trying to do, these guys are a vote for change, and it feels like we've got a microcosm of the future organization of, of the entire company. And it's not happening in some obscure corner. It's happening in the heart of our business. And the, the real revelation here is that you know, all of us are going to succeed or fail based upon whether we're able to innovate. And the research is compelling that diverse organizations actually innovate at a much higher, more effective rate than non-diverse ones. And Shelley, look, I, I'm the master of not answering the question that I'm asked, but I'm actually <laughs> gonna try to answer the one that you asked, which is what about measurement? Because people try to duck this thing. Yeah. And a lot of times when the word measurement comes up, immediately people use or the tagline quota, which is yeah. pretty prejudicial. And I've thought a lot about this. This is not about quotas. It absolutely is about setting some quantitative objectives and then executing a strategy to meet them and holding yourself accountable. So I actually analogize it to all of us set financial targets. Okay, we look at what do we want our business to be in one year, three years, five years, and then we execute a strategy to try to hit that. Now, if we don't hit it, yeah. we don't just artificially make up the numbers to equal the forecast. If you do that, we're gonna wind up in jail. Yeah. Okay, but there's consequences. So if you exceed the forecast, you're held in high regard. If you fall short of the forecast, 
you haven't met that, and therefore there's some level of performance diminution that you're accountable for. This is no different. Why should we be afraid to put out what we believe is feasible in an aggressive but achievable manner, and then execute against it, and if we exceed it, we should be viewed as a leading organization, and if we don't, we're not gonna force the answer, but people should hold us accountable. But then, why aren't we doing it? Like, it need, diversity needs to be a KPI for performance, and if we don't deliver on leadership level, then they shouldn't be leaders in our organizations. And I just want to talk about megatrends because the World Economic Forum today or yesterday, you know, at the beginning of this, published the new reports that it'll take over 257 years to realize economic gender parity. Last year or two years ago, it was 208 years. So we're going backwards. So here we are world leaders, I'm putting myself in a world leader bucket, <laughs> raise the roof. Yeah. We're at the World Economic Forum yeah. of Leadership. We're talking about and just accepting the fact that 257 years is just, oh, that's the new statistic. What the New York Times has done so brilliantly, hashtag me too, yeah. is bring these stories to the surface and then not accept anything shy of change broke the silence, consequence for bad behavior. We believe in the positive, proactive solutions. What are we going to do? Like even leaving the World Economic Forum, you guys were in Congress with white badges. What, what did we talk about? What are we going to do? What did you learn this year? What conversations did we have that were different than last year? Where, what's the hope? Well, I, I won't accept the fact that sort of we just say 257 is what it is, and if we derive that statistic, then we're doomed to it. Leading organizations are putting this in as a KPI. And when you talk about the megatrends, probably the single biggest one that's captured the majority of the dialogue here at WEF is really about our technology-driven future. And you have a wave of innovation that is being driven by the introduction of a number of transformative technologies, whether it's you know, 5G, cognitive, cloud, and all of those are converging to create huge opportunities, but what's the one thing we need to really drive that? We need people. We're sitting here in an economy in the US where unemployment is at the lowest level in 50 years, three and a half percent. We're not gonna realize that tech-driven future unless we have an inclusive society that taps into the best of the entirety of the talent pool and that wins the hearts and minds of society, that this tech-driven future is a positive, which you're only going to do if you crack the code on inclusion. And so you're not gonna get any argument here. This has to be a KPI, and what you're seeing is that more and more of the dialogue in the boardroom is making it a KPI for the leader. So I agree with all of that, and I think disclosure Holding yourself public to account is really important. I mean, and by the way, for us, because we so often report on these things, it's doubly important that we're actually, you know, we're, we're kind of showing that we actually understand that this, this stuff applies to us, ourselves as, as well. And we, for, for a few years now, have been doing an annual disclosure on how we're doing in terms of the broad population and senior managers and the areas where we think we're still falling in some cases woefully shy, and this is in particular around minorities in senior roles in the company. It's a fairly familiar thing. I'm not gonna say you have to understand. I think it's deeply, deeply troubling that we haven't made as much progress. We've got a whole battery of things going on inside the company to try and improve that. What we're gonna add, we've already done a couple of disclosures on equal pay. We're actually gonna make every other year equal pay part of the same disclosure to make sure that, again, people can see at least for this little bit of the world, you know, exactly what's happening. And again, for the population, but also for subgroups within the population. So I think disclosure is part of it. But I think we face some real problems. And I'll, tell you, I'll give you one practical example exactly to what Joe's been talking about. A, a, a world where engineering, software engineering, is going to be a bigger part of the world. What about diversity in, inside engineering? And you know, we're, working, we're trying to work on that inside the Times, but that's a big societal effort to make sure that, that um, uh, more women, more, more, young, more girls and women, and more minorities are given opportunities inside engineering. Because the risk is, in your digital transformation, categories which were once 
somewhat more open to uh, uh, to women and minorities get exchanged for alg algorithms and, and data work, which is actually less naturally, as it were, in terms of the labor force, less diverse. So I think we've got to try and make this change, this enormous transformation, and we're all trying to transform our businesses. We've got to do that, you know, and part of that change has got to be deliberately making sure we're increasing diversity as we transform, not reducing it. And I think that's in peril, actually. And th this gets to the very heart of the role that a free pl press plays in society. I think your point that transparency is ultimately what holds people to account. And I certainly worry with the attacks on the press and all the noise about fake news, it has never been more important to have a vibrant profession yeah. that is out there reporting in an accurate, transparent fashion. And w with respect to sort of diversity in the technology field itself, I mean, this gets to the very heart of making good on the promise that advanced technology is rolled out in an ethical, inclusive fashion. Because when done right, there is no doubt technology has the potential to cure some of society's greatest challenges. Yeah. It also has the potential, when done wrong, to make things worse. You mentioned algorithms. Yeah. And if you have individuals designing these things, using data sets that embed the historical biases of society and constructed by only one segment of society, yeah. all you yeah. will do is you will perpetuate the same problems of the past versus using technology as a mechanism to actually drive equality. Yeah. Well, I mean, bias in, bias out. I well, mean, and we've known, we've known for years in our newsroom that if you want to report African-American communities, if you want to report issues like Me Too, trying to do that with as well, just a, a cadre of, of white male reporters, they can be the best reporters in the world. They won't entirely understand and won't entirely be able to communicate to that, to that community. If you're building a, a, an applied machine learning program, which, for example, is involved in, in parsing faces or parsing identities, and your engineers are not diverse, the risk is that, that, that natural, maybe unconscious bias or uncon unconscious limitation of empathy or whatever it is will be fed into the numbers, and it, you'll actually make a piece of, piece of software which also has got historic embedded prejudice in it. Yeah, but we've seen it. Even with facial recognition technology, there weren't any black uh, technologists and it couldn't read color. Yeah. I mean, as basic as that. Or an example I love to use, airbags in cars. Yep. The number one fatality when the airbag opens is women. That's right. Why? It was made it's, it's by it's men. made to stop me. That's right. Yeah, <laughs> it's made to stop you. Shame on us. I hope both of you are here next year. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> You'll save us. You'll save us all. Seatbelts, yep. they are not comfortable on female anatomy. You don't even notice that. And how I'll many women are uncomfortable pulling their seatbelts all the time? Yeah. Raise your hands high. This one's how all many you. men are uncomfortable yeah, yeah. with a seatbelt? And I, <laughs> I, 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 I'll, give you, I'll give you one more, which I, I, I was talking about earlier today with some co-panelists on, on a panel in the Congress Center. The radio mic. The radio mic, the standard bit of equipment, which is a little microphone and a battery pack which is used in TV studios and events all around the world, it's meant for guys. It doesn't 100%. work. 100%. doesn't work with dresses, doesn't work with, it, it's just like the, you know. Silk blouses, it, it, for it, sure it doesn't work. And, and so the weird thing is, those radio mics have been used for 60 years, and the fact that in 16 years there's never been an attempt to redesign them so they can work for, 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 for different genders. It's, it's quite interesting, isn't it, how the, the, the sort of sexism of every, everyday ergonomics, yeah. But now we're preaching to the choir. Oh, yeah. hello. We know the problem. I mean, well, look at NASA, yeah. and we know, all, we know a lot of the female astronauts. I mean, the last spacewalk, yeah. they only had, they have three <laughs> spacesuits for women. Yeah. Two loose are large. Fitting, loose fitting spacesuits. <laughs> <laughs> and by the way, if it's that time of month and you get puffy, that's not going to work either. That like, wasn't in the prep materials. I know. You those are the things. The I, I have to share some of these things that are the, you know, woo, <laughs> that the New York Times needs to start reporting on. Anyway, so what do we do? Let's talk about, let's talk about, so, 
<laughs> Sorry. Mark, I just want to say one more thing because I want to applaud something that you said, and then I want to go into solutions. You also said you got to walk the talk because if you're going to report outside in, you got to be inside out as well, or that transparency is, is full of baloney. So thank you for, for doing all that. that. That goes a long way. Okay, solutions. I put everything to three buckets for advancing equality. Parity, wage gap, policies that will make a difference to helping us all rise, and pipeline. How do we fill the pipeline with diversity? And for anyone that has not read the book Wisdom of the Crowds, who watches Who Wants to Be a Millionaire? Uh, it's such a good game show. <laughs> who Wants to Be a Millionaire? You got three choices. 50-50, you get 50% chance. Um, ask, uh, phone a friend. If that friend is an expert, hopefully they'll know the answer. But the one that wins every time is ask the audience. A random group of people, all walks of life, it's right at least 94% of the time. Yeah. Diversity at work. We know the business case. So let's go to these things. What are solutions? Like 257 years, not OK. If we want to close these gaps in five years, what do we do? Give me a, an equality hack, a low-hanging fruit. Well, I, I, I'm not sure it's the quite that, but here's an example of, of trying to listen to the audience, which is, uh, and it's more about like step by step. Uh, we significantly extended parental leave, family leave at the Times. Uh, uh, the Women's Network at the Times, I'm the executive sponsor of that, um, about a year later came to me and said, there's a problem. There's a problem. Uh, 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 maybe a couple of problems. One problem being men don't seem to take leave, the leave that they're, you know, what are you going to do about that, Mark? Only 34% uh, of men will take elective paternity uh, leave. Um, and essentially, one thing is we're, we're not going to force people, but we're going to try and be encouraging of everyone to take their leave. Uh, the publisher of the New York Times, author Greg Salzberger, a, a um, young father, uh, um, took full leave, took full leave rather flexibly. And indeed, he's, uh, he's arguing now with our colleagues in HR about let's keep it really flexible because sometimes two days, three days, that can help. But the other big issue is interesting is the longer family leave exposed the fact that we were not and are not very good at, at re-onboarding. The business is changing. Often the jobs are gone. Sometimes the desk is gone. What's the plan? And it's not the right thing when somebody turns up, you know, leaving maybe a new child for the first time, to be, you know, their manager to be slightly surprised. Possibly the manager's changed, like, who are you? Why are you here? What am I doing? Oh, that's a good question. You know, there needs to be a protocol and a plan, and it's okay to phone. Um, parents when they're on parent leave and talk about what they actually quite, they don't like to be asked to do work perhaps, but they would quite like to know what's going to happen when they come back. You can, a month out, a week out, you can prepare them. There could be a pack of information. There should be a welcome when they come back. And even if the job has changed, there is a plan. This is what we want you to do. And so there's, it's like a, almost like a new employee moment again. And we just didn't do that. And we're now going to put stuff in place to make sure that happens. So they, it's really trying to accept that this is a partnership with our colleagues. And you can't, you know, the best HR department in the world won't always figure out every consequence of the action. So to me, it's more like a feedback loop. And so, so what you don't do is like brave, bold, look great on the press release headlines and don't follow through. By the way, so lots of little solutions as well as big. That's a very ones. big solution because the Nordic countries, which are top in gender equality year after year, Iceland, 11 years in a row. Olaf, Olafur, if you're around, you're doing a great job. He's a former president. The number one was um, parental leave, yeah. and you know, to contributing to equality in the workforce and and, and sharing the responsibility at home. So I'll be brief. I see the clock's going to kick us Don't off stage. It. Although you, you, you can control that, right? <laughs> Add some time. Ho ho holy echo. Turn backwards. This starts with the tone at the top. It starts with people like Salzberger yeah. demonstrating yeah. that they're personally invested. But it, it, it has to go beyond that. It has to get cascaded down with accountability at all levels of the organization. We talked earlier about the fact that it's OK to set objectives and to have those objectives owned by various people across the organization and then to measure against that and hold people accountable. And the other uh, real revelation we've had that I'd highlight here is you just can't look at this issue as an HR or talent issue. If this solely sits to the side, 
you're underestimating what it takes to actually drive real culture change. You have to view this as core to the execution of the organization's strategy. And to really win the hearts and minds of everyone, you make this into an issue, not just about talent, people get that, it's about what the next generation demands in terms of the kinds of organizations they choose to join and where they choose to either stay or leave. And it's about clients. It's about real revenue. The fact that our clients are making decisions about who to buy from, who to partner with, based on observed behavior and the makeup of the teams that serve them is either reflecting or not reflecting the values of their organization. And when you tie it to the core of your strategy, you have a much greater likelihood of winning over the skeptics and actually embedding it into your culture. We rewrote the title of HR this morning at our breakfast. Instead of human resources, we said, let's call it Chief Thrive Officer <laughs> to really allow all of us to bring our best selves to the table and to thrive in the workplace. And I was thinking for the World Economic Forum for WEF, because you have such big voices, a couple of years ago they implemented the plus one you know, for every four badges, because we know they're all going to be, you know, the, the white men. For every four, if you bring a woman, you get an extra badge, right? What if you bring a millennial, a plus one as a millennial to the World Economic Forum? Let's see if the table gets more interesting and, and smarter and better. Here's to you, conscious leaders. Thank you for being here with Thank us. Thank you.